Just getting myself set up, guys. Hold on. Sorry, we got a little bit of noise in the background, and I'm running a little bit behind because struggling to get the kayak on top of my car here. So, excuse the audio. There we go. All right, guys, happy to have you guys on here. Just getting myself set up. Uh, running a little bit behind. I'm here at the Marine Field Station. Sorry that we have a little bit of noise in the background. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Give me a shout out if you cannot hear me. Um, oh, excellent. Got a thumbs up. All right, so I'm going to um, get myself set up here. I'm going to stick myself, stick the camera down, just give you guys a little bit of a glimpse. We're at the Marine Field Station again. Uh, this is part of Stockton University. Uh, if you are a student or a faculty here, you know it well because um, you get to do a little bit of research here. Uh, we've got a fleet of boats that you can see in the background. Um, that you can see in the foreground, sorry. And uh, I'm going to just take a canoe out uh, here uh, just to go up the up this river a little bit. I'm actually right off of the Mullica. I'm not on the Mullica itself because that would be a little bit dangerous to canoe on in the major part of it. Um, but I am on an offshoot of the Mullica that goes up to Port Republic. All right, so i um, just going to put myself down here and get myself set up. As always, uh, this is a live stream, so please feel free to um, ask any questions along the way. Um, all I'm going to do today is... Uh, sorry, I'm just getting myself set up. Uh, all I'm going to do today is just go out a little bit and uh, with some waders on... Uh, hop on out, maybe do a little bit of netting and see um, what we can find. Just describe a little bit of marsh ecology. Um, I've got a pretty heavy canoe, so I'm going to grunt a little bit here. Right. Those of you who are just joining on, thanks for bearing with me. Thanks for a little bit of patience and running a little bit of late. Um, get myself set up. Don't tell anybody. I was getting myself set up while I was driving. And again, we are here at the uh, Stockton University Marine Field Station. Um, now, I'm going to, I lied a little bit when I said I was going to canoe ride up. I am going to canoe ride up. However, I'm going to cheat and take a trolling motor, which is perfectly fine. In the state of New Jersey, if you stick an electric motor onto a boat, you do have to register it. We have done that for this one, so hopefully we won't have any problems. If you don't know how to stick a trolling motor onto a canoe, you basically just strap it to the side. Shouldn't be much of a problem. I did it all summer long. Ever important waders and the incredibly important water bottle. Facebook says it's having problems playing this video, no problem watching. Uh, let me check my internet connection here. Oh, apparently I'm on a Wi-Fi, so I'm going to... Oops. There we go. We're back on. So I just changed over from Wi-Fi to a 4G connection because it's going to have to change over. Um, and now I am going to set this inside... Oh, no. I don't think I'm going to do that just yet. Perfect. Thank you, Alisa. 
Just give me a shout out for where you are, where you're coming from, where you're watching from. I'd love to know um, if there's any Stockton alum on here uh, that are new to these live streams. Just let me know. It'd be great to um, get in contact with you. Uh, I don't know where my um, bungee cord is. Hey, how's it going? I don't know where my bungee cord is. Okay. We'll just have to play it by ear then. All right. So, I'm going to set this down again while I get myself set up here. Oh, yeah, Facebook did just switch to a new format and it gets kind of annoying. Facebook seems to always switch to new formats because it thinks that everybody wants improvements. And we're all just used to um, the old style of things, so it gets a little frustrating. Ever important life jacket, folks. Do not go out without one. I don't care. Oh, that's going to create some buzzing. I don't care if it is only... <laughs> I don't know the uh, best configuration for this. I don't care if the lake that you go out on or the river that you go out on is only a few feet deep. The most uh, tragic accidents happen in shallow water. And the reason is because people are stupid. Or people rather, they, I don't know how this is working. This isn't working out for me. That's okay. It doesn't need to be strapped on. It just needs to be around my neck so that I don't panic. Um, so what happens is when people go overboard, they panic. And what I tell my students is, when you panic, you, um, you start looking for the phone that went overboard, and you start, you start looking for the phone that went overboard, you start looking for your wallet that went overboard, and that's when you start getting yourself stuck in the muck, and that's when uh, bad things happen. And so you always want to wear a life jacket, you always want to have one on board, um, because if something does happen, you need to be able to grab onto something that's floating. It's not an excuse. You always have to have one. In the state of New Jersey, of course, it is a law. You have to have one. Um, but I'm telling you, as a um, faculty member and somebody who is very experienced in freshwater systems and in coastal systems, excuse me if you can see my butt crack there, um, in coastal systems, it is always incredibly important have a life jacket on board, especially if you are in um, even shallow waters. I know it seems contradictory, but like I said, the majority of accidents happen when you are in shallow waters. And in fact, I tell everybody that is going to go out canoeing in anything that's dangerous of any sort, uh, especially where you're likely to get some waves, um, to uh, actually go out and flip your kayak or your canoe, right? Go out and just flip it once. Get yourself wet. Wear a bathing suit, of course. Get yourself wet. Um, but know what it feels like. It's kind of like knowing what your brakes feel like when you're driving on ice or uh, snow. Oh, it's already sweating. Princeton Junction, New Jersey. Jade Murphy, Marine Science Major, Holland Township. Oh, great, guys. 19 people on so far. All right, I'm gonna kick off here. Let's see how this goes for me. Tom's River, pretty close by. I actually live up in Heaton Town, so I'm just trying to get myself into the water here by nudging myself. I don't have anyone to push me off, you know? All right, and even though I've got a, even though I have a, uh, oops, get myself situated. Even though I have an electric motor on this thing, 
Um, of course, I have a paddle just in case it fails. Or if I get into some really shallow area and I have to move myself off like that, you definitely... Yeah, so for anybody who's using the new Facebook format, you definitely want to... Um... might want to take a step back and see if it, that's what's causing you problems on this. Sorry for all the background noise with the mic. I'm having to adjust myself here and we'll get going in just a second here. Thank you for everybody's patience. have to uh, get the trolling motor in. So the trick with a trolling motor on the side of a ki on the side of a canoe or a kayak is that you're not directly behind the boat, so you just have to acknowledge that um, steering is a little bit strange. Avid fishermen in Northeast Philly, if you have any fish behavior advice, let us have it. All right. Well, I can talk a little bit about fishing. I'm not a great coastal fisherman. I mean, I'm not a great fisherman. Period. Um, Oh, I'll lower this thing a little bit. There we go. Um, but I can, I actually love fly fishing. And so um, that's because I like uh, paying attention to fish behavior. Oh, I have to get myself situated here. Looks good from Galloway. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for showing up. Right. Also, if you're going to put a motor onto a canoe or a kayak, you actually do have to have a um, boating license. So for any motorized vehicle in the state of New Jersey, you have to have your boating license. Uh, it's not difficult to get. You just have to take a class. It's like 40, 50 bucks and then schedule a time. It does help out a little bit just to know, especially if you're in a kayak going in open water like this where there's going to be larger boats. You know, one of the important things is to know what they're going to do, right? You are the one, you, you are the vessel that everyone's going to give way to because um, you are, you have less control over your vessel than they do. However, um, people are stupid and you have to know what people are going to do. You have to know what the lights mean. You have to know what red versus green mean, red, right, returning, etc. So, great. I am, um, I am en route right now with my trusty 40 pound thrust trolling motor. Um, departed from the Marine Field Station. Looks like we got, we got so many people on. Thank you for joining me all. Um, looks like my audio is working good. Um, so, you know, um, Aaron Gut. I wonder if your name is actually Aaron and you were just always called Aaron because of that stupid Kid. That's my name too. So everybody calls me A. A. Ron. Um, so just some, uh, just you know, you asked about fisherman advice. The really important thing is to study the organism that you're trying to catch, right? If you are going out fishing, the best thing that you can do to help yourself out is to know what you are. Oh, it's a single A. To know what you are catching, right? To know the behavior. To know that. Uh, to know. Uh, when it wakes up in the morning, not wakes up, well, when it starts feeding in the morning and when it starts feeding in the evening, to know how it swims, to know where it eats, and then use your knowledge of that to um, decide how you want your bait to look in the water, right? Just throwing a bobber out there is only gonna catch like bass, right? So if you throw um, an actual, something that looks like what they eat, and if you make it look, if you mimic what they're trying to eat, you're going to catch a lot more fish. Fish are not dumb. Fish are extremely smart. They know what they are looking for. Um, and uh, you have to just mimic what they're looking for. All right. I'm going to put this down while I take a drink of water. Hopefully it doesn't fall on me. Oops. The other thing that they don't tell you when... Um, using a trolling motor with a canoe or a kayak is you have to be constantly vigilant of where you're going because it will turn very quickly. 
All right, so we're just going to go down one of these little marshy areas here. here. I want to point out something. See that that culvert right there? Um, if you've ever looked at a map of marshes, um, you're going to see a whole bunch of crisscross lines, straight lines. It don't look like they have any business um, being... Oh, I wonder if this actually goes somewhere. Ah, I thought it did. Nope. Um, those crisscross lines, sorry, I get off on tangents and I'm trying to do a billion things at once to make sure I don't drown here. Um, all those crisscross lines are, um, if they're not recently developed, and most of them are not recently built, they are a holdover from the 1960s era where we tried to drain all of the wetlands for mosquito control. So not trying to get rid of the water from the wetlands, but try to get rid of all of the standing water from all of the, in, like, inside of all of these grasses and everything. Hopefully there's not too much wind um, because that's where all the mosquitoes breed and we were so incredibly worried about malaria and DDT uh, for good reasons um, or sorry uh, worried about malaria uh, so and we were spraying DDT everywhere um, that we started draining all of the wetlands um, and uh, to do that we had folks carve out all of these straight gullies, I guess you want to call them. ditches is the, is the correct word, ditches, um, into the wetlands to drain them. Well, of course, wetlands are incredibly important, and when we started doing that, we started realizing that all of the ecology of these wetlands um, started deteriorating, and so we stopped doing that, but a lot of those ditches haven't been filled, and so uh, you're still going to see those crisscross lines. Those are not natural. If they're straight, nature doesn't do straight very well. So, um, <laughs> it's going to be a quote in some uh, gay bar. Nature doesn't do straight very well. Quoted by Aaron Stoller. Um, <laughs> Ice eagle. So I believe we have four species of gulls around here. We definitely have laughing gulls, ringneck gulls, black back gulls, and I can't remember the other one. I'm gonna have to set you guys down here while I adjust my motor because we are getting shallower. For those of you just tuning on, I am cheating um, and using a trolling motor because paddling while filming would be incredibly difficult. It would not be impossible to paddle this. It's perfectly fine. The water is not moving and we're actually going out while the tide is coming in, not out. So um, I'm actually moving with the tide right now. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to take that detour. You know what? Oh boy. Oh, I'm gonna crash. So for those of you that don't know, the Mullica is actually one of the most pristine marshy uh, um, estuarine rivers in New Jersey and actually along the eastern seaboard and the reason is because the water that drains into it is coming from mostly uh, the Pine Barrens. Um, I can't remember all of the rivers uh, but mostly the Pine Barrens and the Pine Barrens is protected. That's what happens folks when you protect land you get clean water um, and now uh, we've come to recognize that the, the aquifer, the Kohansi aquifer underneath of us 
is so pristine um, and the water is so valuable because of it that there's now more incentive. Um, now there's more incentive to uh, um, preserve all of that Pinelands area and to make sure that we don't dump. It's not without its problems for sure. We definitely see algal blooms here and there. We definitely see some invasive species, but uh, much less than in most other coastal marshy ecosystems. Ooh, paddling would be better right now. Oh, uh, crash. All right, guys, here's where I gotta set you down. Where on the Mullica are you? So I am not actually on the Mullica proper. For those of you who were expecting me to be on the Mullica, that would be quite dangerous um, to be on the Mullica right near the mouth of the ocean. Um, that would be insane to put a kayak or a canoe on there. I am actually up one of the um, uh, tributaries to it uh, just by the Stockton Marine Field Station. I'm sorry, I don't know what the name of this particular river is. Um, but it does go up to Port Republic. You can put in at Port Republic. There is a parking area and you can certainly put in. You can paddle down from the put-in area at Port Republic. If you don't know where that is, just go ahead and um, uh, look for it on Google Maps. It's like a little parking area with a horseshoe. You can't miss it. It's the only parking area for it in, in Port Republic. It's a great little... Uh, nope. I thought I could do this. I might just be paddling, folks. Yep, you know what, sorry, Nakota Creek. I was blanking on it, Joe, thank you very much. It is Nakota Creek. Um, right now, I'm not on Nakota Creek itself. I'm off one of the tributaries to Nakota Creek, so I'm a tributary to a tributary. If you know anything about marsh ecosystems, about uh, these, these coastal marsh ecosystems, they meander quite a bit. Um, and the reason is because they drain an enormous surface area of land. They're going every which way. I am paddling right now, not using the trolling motor because it's getting a little bit unmanageable. Yes, thank you, Maurice. Maurice. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Um, we are estuarine, so I mean, this is going to be brackish water. It's going to be less brackish. The smaller the water, the smaller the body of water that you're in, the smaller the river size, the less brackish it's going to be because, of course, more of that's draining um, uh, fresh water. Now, some of my marine science colleagues will probably tell me I'm wrong. And in some cases, there are areas where it is small and still brackish. This is a very much a tidal area. It goes in and out with the tide. Especially when going through these... Um, these areas, you really, really, really want to make sure that you keep track of where it is that you're going. Um, because they meander so much, it's very possible to get yourself lost. Um, one easy thing to do is just to kind of keep taking right turns and then keep taking left turns when you go back out. So a lot of the grasses that we have around here are going to be some Spartina. Um, you have a bunch of bulrushes, uh, pickle, pickleweed, I believe it's called, the stuff that you can eat. Not around here. Most of this is going to be um, Phragmites, Australis, uh, so the common reed. I don't know if it's the native. I think it is the native one, uh, not the invasive. You have, um, but most of what's going to be here is the, um, uh, um, what do you call it? Oh, I just said it, and I blanked on it. Spartina, God, help. Some little woody areas. Um, you know, you don't get a lot of trees and you don't get a lot of large vegetation because um, of the tides. The trees are not designed to handle, um, are not designed to handle um, water that moves up and down every single day. They like that stationary land, but there are some trees, there are some woody plants that like to do that. All right, so I have got myself now on a light. Oof. 
My motor is not complying with me. Not like it. I might as well just paddle. So let's talk a little bit about marsh ecology, okay? Why are these systems so important? All right, let's zoom out to the big picture here. Why are they so important? Because they are receiving so much stuff from land, right? These are like the sewage systems for land, except they don't drain into a wastewater treatment plant, right? All of the stuff that we send into our wastewater treatment plants, all the stuff that we send um, through our toilets, through our sinks, they go to these wastewater treatment plants and then we sanitize them with chemicals, with special bacteria. But stormwater that drains onto the land, that carries with it all of this weird stuff, all of these nutrients and stuff, there's not, that's not, that stuff's not being sent to any wastewater treatment plant. It's being sent downstream to a marsh. And a marsh contains its own water purification system. It has things like bacteria and algae and crabs and small little fish that all process all of that stuff that we send downstream, right? Without these marsh ecosystems, we would be polluting our ecosystems, our world, 50% more than we currently are. And that's just a ballpark figure. Oh, you know the reason why my motor wasn't working is because I have a bit of a wind. What happens to all of those nutrients that flow downstream? Algae consume it. Plankton consume the algae. Fish consume all of those uh, plankton. And then larger fish consume all those smaller fish. And then everything gets pooped out. All right, that's a scientific term, pooped out. All of that stuff gets pooped out. And then you have de um, decomposing bacteria that digest all of that poop and recycle all of those nutrients. Everything that this marsh does is what our wastewater treatment plants are doing. In fact, the science behind wastewater treatment plants is largely built on the food web that is what we're looking at right now in these marshy ecosystems, all right? Except no human is doing it. The marsh is doing it for us. It's literally taking our shit, and that's a scientific term too, it's literally taking our shit and processing it for us as if we gave it a present. And yet we think that we can just destroy this area. We think that we can use this area, manage this area as if it were ours, when in reality, this ecosystem is doing us an enormous favor. Now, the specific organisms that are doing everything, now I, don't, I'm, I don't know all of the species of algae and all the species of bacteria, there are thousands of them. Um, if anybody does know dominant species of algae, be my guess. But what you're gonna get um, in terms of the decomposers, your dominant decomposers are gonna be um, crabs, right? Crabs and amphipods are your dominant decomposing organisms, your dominant herbivores. And we're not talking big crabs. The majority of crabs are all these little guys. And all they're doing is just eating, 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 pooping, pooping, pooping. Occasionally, they'll transform some of those nutrients that we give it. Oh, I've hit land. Okay, we're really shallow now. So for those of you wondering my setup here, just to appreciate what I'm trying to do for you guys, I've 
Got a gimbal set up on a kayak, on a canoe, on the center thing of a canoe, on a tripod stand that's smaller than the gimbal itself. And I'm trying to make sure that it doesn't topple over. So far, so good. Now the plants in here are specially adapted to um, tolerate tides, okay? A lot of the plants like pickleweed um, and spartina are actually capable of tolerating changes in salinity. Now if you think about yourself, if you just drank straight salt water, it wouldn't be very good for you, all right? You'd die because your body can't filter out that. It needs fresh water. It can't tolerate salt water. So, Plants are the same way. They need fresh water. Spartina, all these coastal marsh plants are the same way. They need fresh water. All right. What they do is they are incredibly good at filtering out all of that salt. In fact, when you, um, if you take a close look at the underside of some of the leaves of these plants, you're going to see that they can secrete salt out of their, of their leaves. Actually, incidentally, the marine iguana does the exact same thing. I don't think we have any marine iguanas here. <laughs> we don't. Um, the Galapagos marine iguana actually takes in only salt water and then sneezes out rock salt in an incredible way of filtering it. Now, as you might imagine, there's not a whole lot of organisms that can tolerate this. There's not a whole lot of organisms that evolve the ability to just consume salt water. That's the reason why a lot of the plants, the, 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 the ecosystems around here, are not incredibly plant diverse. There's a lot of fish diversity, a lot of detritivore diversity. I'm not even going to begin to start naming all of the fish, all right? Because um, I don't know them, um, and I'm not going to embarrass myself by struggling over top. Um, but uh, the plants here, there's not a whole lot of diversity of plants because there's only a few species that have evolved the ability to tolerate that extreme salt environment. All right, guys, I am getting into some pretty sticky area here. Just switch it here. up. All right, so here's the time when I want you guys to ask me any questions that you have, all right? Anything that you've been curious about. Um, somebody already asked me, like, to describe what the best way for fishing, um, and my answer to that is know the species that you're looking to catch, right? Every single fish is going to try to consume things a little bit differently. Every single fish looks for something different. If you have a species um, that's trying to eat crabs or amphipods, you got to mimic those crabs and those amphipods. You can't just send in a, a rubber worm and get it. you gotta, you got to find what you're looking But don't fish around this part. This is a protected area. What you haven't been seeing are all the signs saying that this is a wildlife refuge. Um, I'm actually not going to go onto the land because that is not really legal. Um, I don't want to disturb anything. I'm okay to be in here with a canoe. Um, but I'm not going to disturb anything. This is really protected area. I actually think that the seeing any shorebirds, um, just gulls. I haven't really seen a whole bunch. I've been talking a lot, and so I've probably disturbed um, some wildlife. Um, if we sat out here for a little bit and maybe just waited and watched, we'd see some herons. Um, what was I about to say? I can't remember. Oh, I think that the biggest challenge, if any of you are thinking about canoeing or kayaking in a marshy ecosystem like this, is it's very tempting, like I just did to kind of meander around all of these things. You really just have to take a GPS system with you and make sure that you uh, know where you are, all right? Again, any questions that you have, anything at all, please just let me know. I mean, I could sit here and just yammer on, but I'll probably just wind up repeating myself. Um, if you are thinking about Stockton or if you're thinking about the field of marine science, I strongly encourage you to check out um, 
Dr. Elizabeth Lacey or Mark Sullivan um, or Suzanne Muskalski's classes. Um, uh, we have a, uh, Matt Landau. Uh, there's a few other people who uh, are just fantastic teachers at Stockton who will teach you all about this stuff. Um, you know, what I study is, is mostly just ecosystem ecology, so I know all of the, the stuff about the nutrient cycles, and so I can talk a little bit about that. Mike Callis asks, any salt hay you can point out? Mike, I don't know what salt hay is. I will fully admit that. Um, if you want to just describe it for me, I can try to find some. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what I do know about the ecosystem ecology. So backtracking, looking at the global picture here of, of salt marsh ecology, um, this, this bay drains most of um, the Pine Barrens. Now there's not a lot of overland streams in the Pine Barrens. Most people, when they think about a watershed, they think about streams that drain forests that go into larger streams, that go into larger streams, that go into larger streams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not, um, that's not what uh, happens in the Pine Barrens. There's not a lot of streams. In fact, because the soil is so porous, so sandy, most of the flow is actually through the ground, right? That water that, I mean, think about um, if you were to pour water onto coffee grounds in a coffee filter, all right? Sorry, I'm reading the comments. If you were to pour water grounds onto a coffee filter, onto a coffee in a coffee filter, the water percolates through those coffee grounds and goes into the soil systems, goes into the, goes goes through that those coffee grounds. The same thing is happening with the sand. Water is falling onto the land. It's not going into a stream or a river. It's actually going straight through um, and percolating through that soil and draining through that soil into the larger rivers. I'll, I'll break here to answer it. What migratory birds come here? You know what? Again, uh, it's not my area of expertise. Please, for those of you that are on the chat, come tell us. You know what migratory birds do come through here. I know the the, the ones that are kind of here year round, like egrets and herons, but I don't know the migratory birds that are of high importance. Please, other people chime in. We're coming up on the migratory season for birds along the east coast. Do these particular areas host any specific species of birds during this time, or do they pretty much go to more open areas? Like Forsyth, also what about during nesting time? Are there, are there any particular birds that you see congregating to nest in these areas? Again, I can't speak towards to the specific species of birds, and I'm gonna guess that there are some people. Um, Lester, if you're on this stream, you're gonna know the answer to that much better than I will. Um, audio is low, did my mic slip? Fine. I'm just talking quieter. Let's see. I'll hold it a little bit. How's that? Hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, so uh, I will address. I will address what you asked about whether or not species do come here. Yes, this is an extremely important stopover for migratory species, many of which are endangered or threatened. That's one of the reasons why Forsyth exists to make sure that, um, uh, and one of the reasons why most of this land is protected by one agency or another, including the fish and wildlife. Between the fish and wildlife and Forsyth, they own most of this and they manage most of this. This area is an extremely important stopover for lots of migratory species. Um, and, you know, let's talk about migratory species. Again, you know, I study ecosystem ecology, which is, um, um, Sorry, Joe asks, salt hay is Spartina, Spartina patents harvested for livestock feed and bedding as well as for mulch and the pest. Oh, okay. Well, then that's the majority of what you're looking at right now. <laughs> most of this is going to be Spartina. Um, Spartina is probably the most dominant plant in this area. Evelyn says no sound here. Is there anyone also experiencing that? I can't make any comments. All right, guys, I don't know what's going on with the sound, but I just um, unplugged my mic setup, so hopefully that fixes it. 
Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, great. So, yes, this area is an incredibly important stopover for migratory birds. I don't know the exact species. Other people can probably answer that much. Mike was better. All right, well, I'll try to get back on it in a second. Um, most people, uh, there's a lot of people on this feed that are probably going to be much greater experts in uh, what species of birds, um, in what species of birds, there we go, uh, migrate through this area than I can be. But yeah, this area is a big holdover for migratory species. All right. One of the reasons why migratory species are so incredibly important is they are literally connecting continents. Okay, think about where birds are coming from. What I loved teaching my class is when you look at a migratory animal like a monarch butterfly or any type of bird that, that, that migrates across continents or bats that come up from Mexico, those organisms are quite literally taking chunks of one continent and to, you're looking at my mouth, that's great. There we go. Taking chunks of one continent and depositing them in the form of their body onto another continent. All right. I love people that are, that, that try to think of countries as having closed borders. Nature has never thought of countries as having closed borders. Organisms migrate across huge swaths of landscape carrying nutrients, energy and nutrients from one part of the world to the other part, across vast swaths of oceans even, depositing one part of the world into another. Just appreciate how incredible that is, that what we're looking at, the grass that we're looking at, the water that we're looking at, the nutrients that we're looking at, may have once originated in southern Mexico or South, even South America, right? We are literally connected by migratory animals that move from one part of the world to the other. That is why preserving these systems is so important. Nature doesn't know your property lines. Nature doesn't know boundaries. You know, I don't want to get political here. I don't know who we have on here, but I know that there is a big push towards making areas more closed borders, protecting borders. As an ecologist, I simply cannot appreciate that because nature has never thought of borders as closed. Nature always has moved mountains, has moved nutrients in the form of birds, in the form of bats, of flying insects, across those borders. Putting up a border wall between North America, between, between the U.S. and Mexico, Mexico is part of North America, is rather silly and actually pretty dangerous if you consider that we might be stopping all of the migratory animals that the U.S. ecosystems rely on. All right, and that's as political as I'm going to get because that's how I teach in my class. You cannot stop the migration of animals. And in fact, they're so important that if we did stop it, we would lose an awful lot of productivity. One uh, cool anecdote that I can give, all right, uh, you know what I'm gonna do so that you guys aren't just staring at one thing, I'm gonna start paddling around here and I am gonna reconnect the mic um, because you guys won't be able to hear me if I don't, so bear with me. Um, All right, audio should be good. I'm gonna start paddling around here, bear with me. Christine Thompson is watching. Christine, you are a marine science expert. If you could tell us a little bit more about um, the uh, specific types of fish that we might find in here, the specific types of crabs that we might find in here. I am not an expert. Christine, you, as a marine science professor, are going to be one of the foremost experts in that. So please do tell us a little bit about your knowledge of this in the chat. Um, 
teach me. I am not an expert. I was just talking about the nutrients um, and how nutrients are so important. So one of the examples that I give to my class, I was just about to say that before I started messing with my mic. One of the, um, one of the examples that I give to my class is, you know when you're flying down, when you're going down the highway and you start getting bugs in your windshield? So a lot of those bugs are stoneflies and mayflies and other insects that emerge. I'm just trying to turn around here, guys, and it's not going well for me. Um, are insects that emerge from water. When those insects emerge from water, they fly onto land looking for a place to mate. When they hit your car window, that ends things. And then you scrub all of that bug juice off of your window, and all of that bug juice then goes flying as mist onto the roadway. But you know what? It's not the end of things, because all of that bug juice then goes back onto land and goes into a plant. There is a great paper that came out about five years ago that showed all of the insects emerging from a stream. They are flying onto land, all right? They fly onto land, then they look for a mate, and they die. When they die, their carcasses are fertilizer for, their carcasses are fertilizer for the landscape around that stream. In fact, the fertility, which means the plant growth, the amount of plants that grow, doubles as a result of all of those insects dying after they fly out. Another great example that we're about to experience up here is the cicadas. When those cicadas emerge, think about all of those nutrients that come out out of the ground and then just get deposited on land, all of those dead animal carcasses, all right? I know it's not pleasant to think about, but you have to, because you know what happens the year after, oh, I lost everybody. I'm back. Woo. Okay, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. All right. Um, so all of the productivity of the forest, the number of squirrels, the number of chipmunks, the number of trees that grow the following year after those cicadas emerge, go into land, die, is double. It's incredible because all of those nutrients are deposited into a new ecosystem, into that forest ecosystem. The same thing happens with trout that swim upstream in the Western Pacific. All of those coho salmon that swim upstream and die upstream after they've mated. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a great Simpsons episode that covers that. All of those salmon that swim upstream and die, and the bears eat all of those salmon, and the salmon carcasses then decompose upstream, all of that stuff is traveling from the ocean up into, the, up into land. The same thing goes for all of these migratory animals. All of those migratory animals are moving across continents, coming to North America, depositing their poop. Sometimes they die up here and they deposit their bodies. And literally parts of our landscape are derived from other continents because of those migratory animals. Not only that, but let's just face it, a lot of those animals are just amazing to watch. They're just amazing to look at. We love bird watching. We love going out in nature and just seeing nature for what it's worth. That has a huge value. Right? Preserving this entire landscape, make no mistake, is really important because it is just pretty to look at. And I, I can actually talk about a dollar value assigned to that. All right, let's think about how much this is worth. How much, I'm gonna crash, how much would you pay, if you like kayaking or canoeing, how much would you pay for a house right by the Mullica River? You would pay a lot of money. All right, there is an intrinsic value to just enjoying nature, to preserving this landscape. In fact, humans love nature so much, we are programmed to love nature. There are study after study after study showing that human psychology benefits from simply being around green plants. We are programmed to be more relaxed when we see the color green. We are programmed to be more relaxed when we see more birds. In fact, there was a great study that showed the instances of pulmonary distress 
and anxiety go down in areas that have a greater diversity of birds. If you live around Central Park in New York City, you are less likely to have anxiety, clinical anxiety, than if you were um, to live in like some townhouse surrounded by concrete. There is an intrinsic psychological, aesthetic, spiritual value to being in nature that we can put a dollar sign on it is, for that reason, so incredibly important to preserve these ecosystems. Now, I haven't noticed anybody in the comments section tell me what types of migratory birds come through. I'm really kind of surprised. Please, if you know what kind of migratory birds come through, there is a lot of people on this stream that would like to know. Um, if nobody does comment, I'll certainly put some in the chat box so that people, uh, after the video is over, so that people um, can learn about it after the fact. I want to point out something. When you're kayaking up here, you can see um, how the bases of these plants are browner than the others. Well, of course, that's because of tide. We're actually experiencing the water coming in for high tide right now. I'm told that high tide is about 1230 right now. Um, so the water is still coming in. In fact, if you were here with me, you would actually see a net um, movement of water towards me right now. So I'm actually paddling against the flow. I'm going to hold this. And yeah. Okay. Mike Callis, thank you so much for that recommendation. I'm going to definitely check it out. Um, another great recommendation that I can give, um, if you are interested a little bit more in the psychology of, of, uh, of why nature is important, check out Braiding Sweetgrass um, by, uh, I can't Last name is Kemmerer. Uh, definitely do check it out. Outward Bound for Teens is based on that. Yeah, Joy. Um, it is extremely important to get students out of the inner city um, and looking at nature. Oh, I might have to turn the motor on here. I'm definitely battling. All right, I'm going to turn the motor on here. For those of you that are tuning in just recently and didn't hear my spiel, I do have a motor on this thing. Not a gas motor. You can't have gas motors. That's strictly illegal. Nope, that's not working for me. Just a simple trolling motor for when I get out into the main part of the area. Um, down at Forsyth the other day and was surprised at the many types of herons, egrets, and sandpipers. Sandpipers, that's all that sounds like. Huge numbers of cormorants as well, not as many ducks. So a lot of those are not migratory. Um, those are just kind of here year round. Um, and the pterodactyl like horseflies were outrageous. Also, osprey was still immature in the nest. Oh, gotta turn the motor off here. I'm drifting, 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 crash. So let's talk about osprey, because um, osprey are amazing to think about from a nutrient and ecosystem ecology standpoint. Think about what osprey do. Osprey eat fish. I have multiple times driven down the parkway 
and have seen is the coolest thing to see. An osprey with a fish in its talons just flying over the parkway. I am dying once in my life. I really want an osprey to accidentally drop a fish right over the parkway and for that fish to just slam in somebody's windshield. I think I could die happy if that ever happened and I saw it. Okay, so osprey, when they eat fish, they um, digest all of that fish onto land. They are taking the nutrients from the water that's in the form of fish and pooping it out onto land. Occasionally they make more osprey babies from that fish instead of pooping it out, right? That's all all of us are, are just displaced poop, right? Here's that, that's food for thought, right? Um, and pooping it out onto land and all of that stuff just decomposes, it goes back into the ecosystem. That's amazing. And osprey eat so much that around their nests, you're more likely to see higher productivity. I was hit by a fish when I lived in Florida while walking my dog out of nowhere smack. But I wasn't there, Evelyn, so that doesn't make me personally happy. I want to see it happen. coming across one of the National Wildlife Refuge signs, so I just want to point that out to you guys. This is all protected area, and that's one of the, I thought that I was going to get out of the canoe and go hiking along the marsh, but first of all, it would be kind of difficult. Second of all, it's not... I could probably get away with it because I am a researcher, but that doesn't mean that I should do it. Um, and I, yeah, unauthorized entry prohibited. I mean, for the purposes of education, I could probably get away with it, but that's not a good thing to do. All right, there's your sign. Don't go in there. This is all protected area. It's nothing spectacular, but you don't want to disturb all the wildlife. All right? Your tax dollars pay for it. And if there's anybody that questions why your tax dollars should be going to this, I'm guessing that not many people watching this would ever question that. But if you do question it, or if anybody asks you, First of all, there's not that many tax dollars that go to it. <clears throat> Preservation of wildlife is one of the most underfunded taxpayers, uh, taxpayer programs that we have. We don't, we definitely, compared to what we put towards defense spending, it's like less than a drop in the bucket. All right. However, there is an enormous benefit. Like I was saying, there actually, be, there, this is crazy. There's been studies that have shown that in New York City, there are required, there, there, there has to be fewer hospitals around areas with greenery because it relaxes people. There's less instances of distress. There's less accidents that happen. Having all of this for humans benefits us. Now, it's really difficult to put a dollar value on, on a lot of the ways that it benefits us. That's not for lack of trying. There are skilled, skilled scientists that try to create what are called budgets to determine how all of this matters. What is the value of a migratory bird? What is the value of a fish? All right, let's just talk about the value of a fish for a second. Let's say that you like fishing, but you don't live by the water. So you take your boat from your house and you drive to the Mullica River with that boat. Oh, I didn't drown. I just dropped the phone again. Don't worry. Yes, we do see some sandhill cranes, um, Evelyn, but not a lot. I am fighting the current, so bear with me. Um, let's talk, sorry, before I crashed. The value of a the value of a fish. When you are driving, first of all, you're spending gas. Okay, already there's value to a single fish that you're going to catch because you're spending gas money to drive to an area. Okay, when you spend gas money, that's profit in somebody's pocket. Okay. Oops, sorry for the wind. Oh man, it's getting a little unruly here. So that's profit for somebody's pocket. Then. When you, get to the, when you get to the dock, all right, 
you're going to launch your, your boat. You probably bought bait somewhere. That's money in somebody's pocket. All right? You drove on a road. Somebody built that road. That was jobs paid for. Okay? Now, you go out on the boat. You enjoy a nice, relaxing day. What happens? You get hungry. You get thirsty. You go back on the boat. What do you do? You stop over someplace for, for lunch or for dinner. Boom. More profit in somebody's pocket. All right? You're going to drive home. That's more gas spent. And then what do you do with the boat? You have to maintain the boat. That's a huge industry itself. A single trout or a single fish, any fish that you catch, is actually worth a lot of money far more than what we invest to protect it. All right, put this camera back down. Guys, I think I'm actually going to cut this live stream short for data purposes. Um, I didn't see anybody talk about the migratory birds in the live stream, so you know what I'm going to do? I am going to uh, research those migratory birds and post them in the chat later on. Um, and answer any questions that I didn't get to. I have got to meander out of this and pushing against the tide. So thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll catch you guys later.